Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Way Forward. I'm Judy Olian, president of Quinnipiac University. We're going to wait a couple of minutes till people sign on. Welcome, everyone. So let me introduce our guests. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have um, two great guests here for a conversation on the way forward in uh, professional sports. Um, first is Peter Guber, who's currently chairman and CEO of Mandalay Entertainment Group, which pr produces movies and series. Uh, but he's been a lifelong entrepreneur and had many, many um, careers and interests where he's uh, really excelled. Before Mandalay, he was chairman and CEO of Sony Pictures, chairman and CEO of Polygram, co-founder of Casablanca Records and Films, president of Columbia Pictures. He also has a lot of interests in the sports world, professional sports world. He is co-owner and co-executive chairman of the NBA's Golden State Warriors. He's an owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers and owner and executive chairman of Major League Soccer's Los Angeles Football Club, LAFC. He's also not stopped there. He's expanded into esports and gaming and is currently co-chairman of esports company Axiomatic. He's a motivational speaker, a best-selling author, and a professor of about 45 years at UCLA. And I had the pleasure of teaching with Peter for 12 years at UCLA. Um, also joining us today is a member of our own Bobcat family, Michael Zavatsky. He's a graduate of 2006 in business, marketing and psychology to be exact. He took a position after graduating in the Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment uh, in right out of college after having interned with the company. Uh, bs &E operates state-of-the-art sports venues and manages some premier sports franchises. He spent 14 years there. He helped secure some relationships with some mega brands such as Calvin Klein, Coke, Nike, Anheuser-Busch. And he secured the first fan duel as one of the uh, first major uh, pro partnerships with uh, fantasy sports. Spent the last year leading commercial sales, marketing and PR efforts for the entertainment company Rock Nation. Jay-Z's um, company, and that caught the eye of the NBA's Detroit Pistons. And in June of this year, he joined the company as chief business officer of Pistons Sports and Entertainment, where he oversees all sales, marketing, and creative operations for the Pistons. So welcome, Michael and Thank Peter. You. And we have some great guests to uh, speak to about pro sports. And please know that anyone in the audience can uh, submit a question, which we're going to try and get to through the chat function on Zoom. So please do that at any point. So let's start uh, maybe with you, Michael, and uh, help us understand the business model of a major pro basketball team. Talk through the sources of revenue between sponsorships, tickets, broadcasts, advertising, advertisers. How does it break down? And then sure. we can talk about how that's impacted by COVID. Sure, sure. Well, our, our main source of revenue um, or the largest source across is obviously the TV and broadcast rights, um, both at a league level and then also at the team level. But as you mentioned, there's a bunch of ancillary uh, revenue sources when you think of ticket sales, sponsorships or advertising um, and the like merchandise and um, you know apparel sales as well across the league so there's a variety of different revenue sources that obviously roll up but uh, the TV broadcast media rights are, are the largest and so Peter is that true of your market with the uh, Golden State Warriors and is it true of the other sports franchises that you're involved with well it depends upon uh, how your team and organizations put together. For us in San Francisco, um, the television is not the big um, market maker for us. It's good, important, but it's a small market. San Francisco is not a big market. It's actually a very, very small market. And you make these deals, you know, way in advance of now. It was made 10 years ago and it's got 10 more years to run. So the times are different then. And you suffer either the benefit or the burden 
of those changes when you have those fixed models. And so our television revenue is not the biggest part by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Ours is the tickets, suites, uh, uh, sales, the, they're, they're the largest portion of our revenue stream and the most important, and of course, the most interrupted, whereas the digital delivery of, of media, is, while interrupted, is still being able to be a significant piece and delivered to the audience. We do not have butts and seats, and without butts and seats, there's no bucks in the pocket. And would that be true of your soccer team or the Dodgers? Yeah, well, you know, just think, last night I went to uh, two games. I went to uh, the largest throughput stadium in the world, Dodger Stadium, 56,650 seats. Um, and um, they, they, there were no fans, none. And we were playing the Astros, who we were in the finals uh, for the, well, uh, the World Series last year. And that place would be sold out, 56,000, with huge revenue from parking, huge revenue from parking, huge revenue from food, merchandise, real, real major levers that would make that successful. There was nobody there, only me. There were, there were three owners allowed, and the other two were on lived in Chicago, the one was out of town. I was there with 56,000 seats. So that model is completely different. I mean, that model without, you know, without butts and seats, we have a giant television model. It's a big, big market in Los Angeles for, for uh, uh, baseball, and we have a huge, huge multi-billion dollar deal. So it gives us some help, but without those other revenue sources and, without, and with all the costs we have having the place, it's not a good situation. We have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of loss. Then I drove over that same night, that's, that game was on at five, and then at eight o'clock that night, I went to my football stadium, a brand new stadium, an $800 million enterprise value, brand new, huge 24,000 seat stadium. And there were only three of us there in the stadium, the two other owners and myself, and no seats. Now there, the television revenue doesn't really mean all that much. It's very, very small part. And seats, the stadium, revenue, merchandise is what keeps us afloat. So each place is a little different, uh, quite a bit different. And whether it's a major market, a minor market, or whether, like, now, those are both Los Angeles teams. You look at the Lakers, Jeannie Buss, she's in a really interesting situation. So she has a giant television deal, huge, one of the biggest in the league television deal. And, and she has no butts and seats either. They're in a bubble in, in Orlando. However, that television deal is so big, it can really cover her. And the other part of that is they don't own the arena. So they don't own the arena, they don't own those costs and the operational costs of the arena. And they have no debt because of that. We own our arena and have a huge debt. So both the cost and the revenue side are different in each market to some great extent. So I'm gonna to get to the arena in a moment, but let me just go back to Michael. So when you were saying that the predominant source of revenue for you is the broadcast contract, does that mean you're somewhat protected during COVID without quote the bucks in the seats as, as Peter was saying? Well, to Peter's point, our TV deal is somewhat new. Um, so we're on the benefit of having it done in more recent times. But yeah, I mean, we're still impacted, obviously, right? And and there's a lot of questions around next year, specifically, you know, obviously, will there be fans or not? Because the ticket revenue is, is a large source, not only for us, uh, as Peter mentioned, but across the league as well. And we'll have implications in a variety of different ways, uh, depending upon how that gets situated. Okay, so now let's get to the arena, the Chase Arena, which was a, a visionary investment when you brought the team in from Oakland. Um, tell, tell us about what's happening there. Um, I mean, I think it was a $1.4 billion investment. It was much broader in concept than uh, just the basketball uh, purpose. So talk about what your thinking was and how that's being impacted now. Well, uh, how I think we looked at our enterprise, we, we, we thought of ourselves in the location-based entertainment business. Uh, basketball was a core element, obviously, because it was the lightning rod. But the beacon is also important. All the, all the uh, activities at, at a 16-acre site with a major park, a major plaza, uh, a, a huge theater, an enormous amount of retail, all of which we own. I don't know what's going to happen to it, and restaurants. 
So it was an activity center. It was a, it was a broad reach for location-based entertainment, out of home, location-based entertainment. And with that, you make that investment um, with all of your, your folks using that as the lightning rod that draws people to come to your activity because there's so much else to do, uh, whether it's uh, 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 music acts or concerts or conventions, uh, all kinds of activities. So we had a very broad, we cast a broad net as to where we wanted to go and how we wanted to do it. And we built it privately. We didn't get anything. Let me use the word anything from the city of San Francisco in terms of economic reward or benefit. Although they got a lot of work, a lot of people have work and brought a lot of revenue in, you didn't get anything from it. It's a privately financed, fully privately financed uh, uh, vision. And the idea was we believed in location-based entertainment. And we believed we could bring people to the venue, you know, 365 days a year, a la a West Coast Madison Square Garden. That wasn't like Oakland. Oakland, we didn't own the venue. It was 60 years, the oldest venue in, 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 in uh, professional basketball. And uh, we didn't run the acts, uh, all the other activities that were there. And we didn't control the parking. I mean, we literally were tenants. So we went from tenants to uh, the benefit and burden of being the true owner of the whole vessel. And the idea was that we believe in location-based entertainment. We believe rendering experiences to an audience is a valuable business proposition. And our basketball team was going to be at the center of it after five years of the finals. So how do you cope now with the, the revenue sources having disappeared and or not disappeared, but certainly diminished. And at the same time, you are carrying some very large fixed costs, whether it's in uh, Chase Arena or um, with teams uh, that you're paying. So how do you, how do you cope through COVID? You cry quite a bit. You have some you have a lot of <laughs> issues available to cry. And then you need a megaphone to cry for help and, and be active in your own rescue uh, to believe that uh, you have to believe that it's going to come back, that location-based entertainment, that sports, and uh, the value proposition of fans being in a venue is going to be something that is sustainable and, and, and profitable and good. you got to believe that. And we do. We fully believe that. Um, and that this COVID will like other um, situations are the same, will ultimately be either uh, how, you know, collared, protected, and ultimately hopefully disappear. But what you do is you just have to cut your costs down as much as you can. And then you have to you know, try to get a, a collegial effort amongst all the owners to try to do the things that will resize the business maybe, that redo, redo the relationship between players and and the, and the uh, uh, ownership. Uh, maybe it's uh, looking at the model of how many games or what you do. And there's, there's, there's a million, not a million, there's a few different ideas being uh, always examined by the league and by the teams themselves. But the reality is the COVID has to go, go, go if this industry is going to go. I mean, I just don't believe if, if COVID is a lasting condition that anything the way we look at it can really sustain itself in the same way it is now. You just can't. So the idea is this is kind of like having your finger in the hole in the dike. You're just holding on and you're, you're really trying to make the best of the situation and believe, and you have to believe that it's going to uh, be some return to the original model of fans and stands. And I think that, that, that you can see how much the fans want to be there and how much it's a part of their life. But today it's not really a part of the business proposition because the government doesn't allow it. Um, any other thoughts, Michael, on coping during COVID? Sure, well, I'm on sort of the opposite side of the coin from, from where Peter's teams are. Um, you know, when I was in Brooklyn, we operated seven different properties, three brick and mortar venues. So I was very much aligned with where he was there. Here, I'm a tenant, right? So I'm, I'm focused on other things. And I think I've had the benefit with everything going on in Orlando um, and us not participating, which I would rather be participating, but unfortunately we're not, um, to really focus on 
what do things look like on the go forward? And we've spent a lot of time, we have a, a model which we're gonna run out um, in a couple of weeks around a virtual ticket that allows people the in arena experience, but at home. Um, and we're piloting that with uh, our partner, Fox Sports Detroit. So we'll be able to roll that out and test drive it in a few weeks. Cause I do think to Peter's point, consumption patterns will likely change regardless of the outcome of this. So I, I think assuming we can go back to a situation where we're allowed to have the live experience, I think people will. And, and we've already seen that with some of the other NFL games recently, but also I think there's going to be a new way to consume. And that's where we've been spending a lot of our time because we know how to do the fan scenario. We need to focus on the, the scenario of no fans and how we can engage and monetize that. So let me um, pivot just a little bit and talk about the experience aspects of, of the games, because in a sense, you both come out of um, some aspect of entertainment, uh, of the entertainment industry. So first of all, how do you create or expand the on-ground experience in the post-COVID world? And then how do you use digital media to um, leverage the experience even virtually. So talk about that, maybe Michael, you start and then, um, and then Peter. Sure, from a virtual perspective, I think we're looking at doing as many things as we can that you would have been able to do in, in an in-person scenario, now digitally, right? Things like a meet and greet with a player or an autograph signing session, um, you know, all of those types of things you can do virtually. So we're, we're, you know, finalizing plans on how those go to market and, and get activated. In terms of in person, I think to some extent, it's going to be dictated by where things fall um, for the go forward, because obviously, there's going to be changes to how we can and or will be allowed to operate. And I think before we you know, can make determinations as to what the in-person experiences look like. I think we need to know what the ground rules are. Peter, experience, you know, a digital you know, experience. You know what, what it is, is you have to really kind of think out of the box. And it's just the way Michael said, you have to really uh, retune, retune your uh, approach to your fans to keep them engaged. This is an, the, key of the, the key of this business is engagement. Um, if you don't get the engagement and just observers, they, you lose that special element of sports fanaticism because you really realize that most sports people going to sports events, they believe they make a difference in the outcome. And they do. Often they do at games. But, but you don't have that same way. We haven't been able to find that same engagement framing device yet. And I think Michael has some good ideas of that. But um, uh, we haven't been able to find that yet and what it will mean economically. Uh, I think we have to look for it. Uh, However, what we have going on now is two things that I think will be very interesting and may be upticks in the whole business. One is I think that gambling and gaming is going to be a big piece of it. You know, the audience, when they bet on something, have a much more, even if it's, a, even if it's an item or, or money, have a much more level, deeper level of engagement. They feel much more a participant than a passenger. So that's something that I think will get more traction now during this time, and we'll see where it goes, that it would have gotten, it would take a longer time uh, before this. The second thing I think that'll happen is, um, I believe it'll accelerate virtual reality. I just do, I see what Apple's doing. Apple bought one of our companies. And I just believe that, that uh, digital technology is gonna provide an in-venue experience at home, a better in one than just flat television. And I think that'll make the audience even feel more participatory. I've seen many things with VR, and I think this is the beginning of the beginning. It's not the end or even the middle. But I think some of those technology things will come along, which will help the engagement level of fans, because that's where the value really comes, engagement. And the third thing that I think is interesting, other than gambling and other than VR, that's, that's really, I think, a value proposition that we're going to think about, and I think we'll think about it really soon, is that the audience is going to buy the product in different ways. They're going to, you know, right now, when you watch it on television, you watch, you watch it on television, you watch it on TNT. Maybe you have a, a bundle, but you're watching it on TNT, or you're watching it on one of the digital delivery systems, the NBA League Pass. 
But I think there's going to be a lot more changes in that and a la carte, the offerings that can be delivered dig, uh, digitally, which will be priced accordingly and give the audience more of an in-house experience. But right now, I think we do all those things, but boy, we got we to gotta pray to the sports god that COVID's over because if we don't get butts in the seats, my opinion is there's going to, this won't be an evolution. This is going to be a revolution. Um, and, and I'm encouraging people in the audience to keep asking questions. Um, this is one that is flavored by um, a, a viewer's question. And that is, are, are you encouraged that there has been some uptick in uh, viewership of, of games, of sports on television? Golf is one that has gone up. Um, we've seen already a transition to some kind of blurring of the lines between traditional sports and esports, like Formula One or NASCAR on television. So, are we already seeing that transition where, first of all, viewer patterns are um, encouraged on television, but then that will open up the door to a number of different ways of consuming sports? So, what do you think? You want to start, Peter? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not Karnak. I, I, I can't really predict what will happen in the future. But but I would say that that um, if you really looked at the landscape, and I'm, I think Michael will, will agree with this, about a few months ago, there was no sports on television. There was none. I mean, you know, you watched, you know, somebody alone walking on a golf course. You, you would have watched a fly landing on flypaper. I mean, there was literally nothing on sports at all. And all the sports media stations, the ESPNs and all the Fox Sports, all the news elements in sports were, were pretty vacant. Um, the people, the leverage of the people watching sports on television uh, is a, both a domestic and a, 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 a local and a national level. My own view, my own personal view is that that will continue and it'll expand. And I think you'll see more reach in touch with sports directly to consumers because the audience is fractioning right now and you can reach them. So my, my belief, my experience is that the world is changing because also the audience is changing. I see in my esports business, I started it from ground zero. I mean, ground zero and built one of the, I think a really great team, uh, Team Liquid in our esports business. Fortnite, we're involved with all the major uh, games and we're talking to a digital audience, not, a, not an analog audience. We're talking to a digital audience that are already 25, 27, 29 years old. And that's the way they're consuming sports. And the question is, uh, is that going to expand or will that attitude expand over into the sport, uh, over into traditional sports? I don't see the pickup, Michael, in, in, uh, in um, the NBA 2K thing. The numbers are really quite small. They're not really, you know, super, super promising. Whether you can move those people over into that category or the people that are digital back into the traditional side of the sport. I don't know what your point of view is on that. Yeah, no, I think the way that we're looking at it or, or trying to look at it is take the success of Fortnite as an example, right? And how people consume that game. There's a lot of optionality and functionality that that consumer has to control their viewing experience or playing experience. We want to apply that to the broadcast, and I'll use broadcast in a general term. If you don't want to participate with all of the bells and whistles, you can watch the base product. But if you do want to consume differently, you can and have that option. So I think that's how we're trying to look at it on the go forward, provide functionality and optionality from a viewer perspective, more aligned with the gaming audience. Um, because to your point, the consumer, that's who we're trying to reach now. The consumer that's already watching us is sort of trained on how to do that and will follow suit, but we need to pull in that younger audience that, that is the next generation of, watch, of viewers. And so do you see, I mean, Peter is quite involved in esports already. And to some degree, we're seeing a, a case where um, some of the gaming transcends the very sport that they started out with as a source sport. So do you see um, some of the uh, growth of esports uh, continuing and accelerating because of COVID? 
So we're looking at it. We're launching um, a platform. I, I can't say the name of it, but it'll be by the end of the month where we're kind of blending the two together. Uh, to Peter's point, it's not the uh, you know NBA 2K league, but we're taking the esports model and allowing our Pistons consumers to participate in it and earn points or in a loyalty system um, for playing games that they normally would have played, but within our universe, it's all API enabled through the cloud. You can play your Xbox or, or PlayStation uh, through this platform, but also then accrue points that you can redeem for your favorite team, right? So you can buy merchandise or tickets or get sponsor prizes for that. So again, taking the esports, the success of esports and sort of melding it into our world, but allowing you to play the games that you would normally play anyway and not forcing you into one avenue. So I think there is a ton of convergence and we're trying to lean into it. The very part of that that's, that's crucial is, he, and he's right, that, that this audience is, you have to provide participation for the audience. You have participation when you go to the game. You're sitting in the seat, you're cheering with people, there's a whole cohorts of people believing they make a difference in the outcome, as I said. So I think that digitally, this is going to enhance that. The question will be, will that bring people into the stadium or arena, or will it keep them at home? And that's a real, real question, because if you look at the esports audience, the bulk of the esports audience do not go to sporting events. The bulk, the very biggest portion, they do not go to NBA. They don't go to NFL. I'm not saying all of them, but they're not, they're not really super advocates of it. So there is, there is a real split in that audience, and that audience is growing. While the audience for basketball, baseball, and football, I can tell you, I face it every day, is you know, 45, 50, 55, 60. The audience for digital, digital sports, eSports, that whole game-playing audience is from 8 to about 30. And there's a real divide there. There's a digital divide there. So I think that's going to be interesting whether or not it, that it will convert anybody into going to the arenas when the arena or stadiums open up again. I don't know the answer to that, but I know one thing. There is two distinct audiences right now. And, and, and maybe they are, to some degree, parallel audiences without necessarily uh, intersecting. And you're growing two separate audiences by virtue of the same game. Is that a possibility? You know, I, I, I don't, I, I really don't think so. I, I don't think that it's a natural entry point into basketball or baseball by playing the, the video game or uh, the baseball goes or the 2K basketball game. I think that they're just, they're just the entry points are just different. And with the, so many young people growing up being so, you know, digitally native, you know, uh, and that's maybe their first turn at real interactive living in sports, they may stay in that area. I, I, I wish I could answer that question. I, I am concerned that the, the in-venue audience is aging up. It's not aging down, it's aging up. And whether or not this will be a new entry point for it, the, some of the digital offerings, we'll have to wait and see. But I, I'm, I'm a little anxious about it. Well, and of course, in collegiate sports, we're also really interested in seeing how Esports evolves for collegiate sports, not just in professional sports. But I'm going to switch topics in the interest of, of time and, and, and turn to the role of the NBA around Black Lives Matter. And, and the Warriors recently committed, I think, 10 million over 10 years to commit to greater economic empowerment in the Black community. And I, I could see your imprint on, on the four pillars that the Warriors mentioned. Uh, I mentioned that I taught with Peter for quite a number of years, and I have heard him say this many times, that your voice, your wallet, your feet, and your heart have to walk in the same direction. And those were the pillars of your plan, <laughs> Black Lives Matter um, plan for, um, for, for the Warriors. So talk about that for a moment. Well, I think it's part of an overall uh, league, uh, overall league effort uh, to address the issue, to address the issue uh, with the partners that are involved. That means the people of the community, the, the people of color of the community, uh, like-minded souls that feel that we have to do something, you know, formidable, 
uh, to move the meter, to, to, to move it forward in a, in a great leap forward. And so we wanted to, to, we already were very, very active, very, very active in the local San Francisco community, supportive of the league and its efforts. We wanted to deploy more resources, human and financial, uh, to do it in connection with the people of the community. The key, key is to be, really have your feet on, uh, on the ground, not just tongue wagging, but your feet really doing the work and, and, and really making a difference. Uh, this, is the, this isn't the end of that. This isn't even the end of the beginning. It's the beginning of the beginning. It's a long journey. It will need a lot of resources, uh, a lot of patience, a lot of impatience as well, and a lot of effort by a lot of people. It, you're shaping, see, everyone thinks this money and this funding is shaping, is, is, is about the aptitude of making it all work. It's also shaping the attitude. It's shaping the attitude of your team, your offering, your community, aligning yourself with, uh, you know, the right course of action as a voice, in a, uh, as a sports voice uh, in the community that's involved with not just, not just the basketball team, but with arts and conventions and leisure time. And your, your, your people are your most important attentive audience that you've got to pay attention to. And we've got to be part of that community. So I just, I think this is, as I say, this is the beginning not the end, and we've had beginnings that haven't gone anywhere. Everybody's had seen them, and we're determined to put uh, our full effort on this. Uh, how about you, Michael, and the Pistons? How are you reflecting the Black Lives Matter priority in the team? Sure. I mean, I think what you've seen recently is the power that the NBA platform has, uh, particularly over the last month or so. And I'm, I'm happy to say we're not just talking the talk. We're certainly walking the walk here. Um, our coach has been at the forefront, Dwayne Casey, and very active. Um, and we, as a, as a team, as an entity in the community, have from day one been extremely uh, engaged and involved. And I think you'll see us continue to be more so. Um, I'm proud of our organization and, and what we've done to date. Again, not just saying things, but truly acting in the community. Um, and I think you'll see a continued focus on that from us. So I'm going to um, reflect uh, a piece that was written by one of our uh, own students, a junior, to Lloyd Brown in our newspaper, where he, he wrote about the Milwaukee Bucks' decision to sit out their playoff game, followed by the rest of the NBA, and then other leagues who did that, Nomi Osaka, who just won the U.S. Open also set out her semifinal in the Cincinnati tournament. So he asks the question, Torloy asks the question, whether it's appropriate or even fair that it is the NBA where 80% of the players are black that seems to be bearing the burden of, of the athletic enterprise across all sports, even more so than the owners and certainly more so than other sports. Uh, to help solve this national crisis, this social crisis that we have. So, so he asked the question about, is it fair that, they that they're bearing that burden of change? Or is it, do you think, a role that they welcome playing? I mean, they, like I mentioned before, I think they have the platform, obviously, to, to help cause change. Uh, and I think what the Bucks did and obviously what the NBA has continued to do is, is helping call attention and awareness to, to something that we as a country obviously need to make sure we're focused on and pay attention to. Um, and I, and I think as we proceed forward, you know, I, I think they'll continue to be engaged leaders in that effort because they have the attention obviously of the country. They're on media every day, whether directly or indirectly. Um, so I think that, you know, they're in a position where they truly can affect change. Yeah, they're active participants. They're, you know, they, they, they feel it. They live it. They, they're, they're not observers of it. They're experiential. And so their voice comes from the inside. It's not something just you're recognizing. They're telling you what they feel and what they live. And so in their voice, since you're, you're fans of them in the, in the community and you cheer for them, you listen to them, so they they do they do have a megaphone, and they're using it effectively. I think they've used it, you know, actually responsibly. And uh, I I feel that uh, the attitude 
of the players and the aptitude of the work they've done, and they're going to continue to presum presumably to do it, will be a big difference maker. And we all should lead and follow with them. I think that their voice is completely authentic. And so that's why it resonates so well. And I think that they take, they have some risk in doing it in this world. They, you, know, you have to give them a lot of credit. You say, well, they're wealthy, they're rich, what do they have to lose? Yeah, they have a lot. They, they, have a, they, have a, they have a real reputational standing, both in their community and the greater community. And they're, they're putting it on the line. I, I give them a lot of credit for being not just outspoken, but spoken correctly about it. And I feel, feel that they've had good leadership on the issue. The question will be, you know, how do we make sustainable change? And that requires, it's a marathon, it ain't a sprint. And I think that's really what, that, that, that these players and the ones that follow, if they continue to exercise appropriately and effectively their right to speak out and bring attention to all the issues and, and be a, uh, an advocate for change, I think they, that everybody will join them and should join them because their journey is correct. Um, both of your teams are not in the uh, bubble that is, uh, that is playing in the playoffs. How do you keep your teams, your fans in particular engaged when they're outside of this? That's a big, that's a big, obviously a big challenge because most of your fans are drawn for, let's face it, for the games and the contest and the competitiveness and their participation and being able to go to the game or watch the game or talk about the game. So when you're not playing on the field, um, you have resources, you have players and you have the brand and you have a video operation and a digital operation to stay in communication and connection with them. That's the key to try to align your sponsors and your, your, um, the assets that you built to, to continue the conversation, to continue the connection, to provide them with tools and resources that they can carry forward the conversation and the, and the, study and the examination of your team. It's not easy because when you're out of play for these long, this long period of time, we're not even practicing. So you're, you're going six, seven months, eight months with no, no official practices, no, nobody on the floor, and the, the voices are separate. And so it's a, it's a real challenge. It's different than if you were playing in the bubble because you're constantly making no, noise, news, and your fans can still cheer and root for you. Uh, those of us, I think they're the, the, we call them the delete eight. Is that what they call them, Michael? Yes, that's correct. So the delete eight don't get a chance to even practice or do anything. So it's an additional burden and challenge and problem in trying to stay connected with your fans and trying to make a promise that you don't know yet when we can fulfill it. When will they be back in the venue? When will they be back seeing their team play? Nobody knows the answer. We don't even know yet when exactly when next season will start. We don't know when the draft is. All the little major elements that, com that help complete the picture are still questions. Well, I, I was going to say, first of all, I've been in the NBA. This will be my 17th season next year. Peter, if you want to share one of the rings that you have, I'd gladly take one because I don't have any. I'm going to bring up one thing about his ring in a moment. But, go ahead. <laughs> but I think um, – I think the NBA has positioned itself as a 365 day a year platform and more so than any of the other sports, in my opinion, at least it's sort of rooted in lifestyle. People consume it for a variety of different reasons. That could be fashion. That could be music. There's a lot of culture tied to what the NBA is. And I think what we're looking to do here, and I've only been here three months, but we've already leaned in is sort of similar to what I did when I was in Brooklyn we created more of a lifestyle brand. You may have wanted to come to the Barclays Center because you like the culinary experience or the music or how we leaned into fashion, um, not necessarily because there was a basketball game going on, although we hope that was the reason. Here, we're gonna look to do the same. How can we cross over more into those areas to give people more of a reason to like us in a variety of different ways? Yeah, the, only, uh, the only question with that, and I, I agree with that completely, 100% well said. The only question is that until we can gather in the modern day campfire, you know, we can't have three people standing more than 10 feet apart in, in, a, in 16 acres where we are. So it really, it, it, you, you can connect with them digitally and through television and through other, uh, other media. But, you know, I still think the modern day campfire for real success depends upon us getting together physically sharing some space and 
cheering and crying and moving together. So we can't take our eye off that prize too. We just have to, we have to get back to some kind of a new normal. Agreed. So this brings me to the question that both of you have backgrounds, um, movies for you, Peter, music and entertainment for you both. How do you connect the dots? And I, I think we've talked about the experiential aspects of, of um, sports. How do you connect the dots between your background before and what you're doing today? You wanna go first, Michael? Sure. Um, I always try to look at it from a consumer standpoint. If, if I'm the consumer that's purchasing, viewing, watching, participating, what would I want to see or hear? Um, so I've always tried to look at it from that lens. I think, you know, to Peter's point earlier, the music side of the business, I, I truly think is, is an in-person experience. You know, a song reminds you of something or puts you in a place with other people. And I think that in-person experience is sort of irreplaceable. They've done a nice job with some of obviously the, you know, virtual experiences, but right. it's not the same. And I think we need to, you know, further again, to Peter's point, be able to create the connection that music has to people in the sporting space. So it's a, it's more of a pull in and instead of a push. I think that's, I think that's really well said. I add one thing, because it's been the way I connected all the things I do, and that is I looked and defined my life as a connector. Uh, I'm not the, I don't play the music, I don't play the baseball the game, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I don't play it in the field. I'm connecting artists and audiences and rendering experiences. And it's just as you said, I think if we can use the vehicles we have to render experiences to our audience, even if they're not directly on point of, of the basketball game or the baseball game, whatever it is, we can stay connected to our audience. We can provide value to them. I think what you said, Michael, really uh, triggered in my head a, a new thought, and I think I thank you for it. That is, that is, we have to think about, really have to think about it. What is it that they really want? What is it they what they want? Engagement. They want emotional engagement, and the activities we present give them emotional transportation. It's not information. No, it's not what, that's not what happens. It's emotional transportation. It's a feeling of liveness that comes uh, from the experience of participating, whether it's in a concert, whether it's, a, uh, whether it's bull riding in the venue, whether it's, a, whether it's a, uh, um, a convention, whether it's a dining experience, whether it's a basketball game or baseball game. That those experiences, that's the, 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 the stuff that makes people sell your product to other people. They share their experiences together. And so the idea, which you said, really made me think about things a little differently today, Michael. I think you're right. We have to use the tools we got to get the audience we want. And I think that's really the game at hand. So I'm, I'm going to ask Peter, because we're running out of time, but I have endless numbers of questions. But I'll ask Peter this one from the audience. And this is about uh, Peter's early investment in gaming and axiomatic and Team Liquid, which I think has won uh, the Worldwide Olympics in, in, in gaming. What made you invest in something that was not exactly in your wheelhouse at the time? You know, you look at either one side or the other, you look at it, the artist or the audience, and you say, that's, they're, they're all artists, all the ball, ball players are artists, and Michael and I manage artists, and we manage venues, and we manage audiences, and we try to bring them together. So when you see an audience congeal around an activity, when you see the kind of depth of commitment that the esports audience had, how viral it was, and how connected it was, and how how, how they relished their successes and how they were admonished each other for their failures and the losing and winning. And when you see the products around it, you say to yourself, unless you're asleep, hey, wait a minute, this is a giant audience, a giant uh, engagement audience. How do I either tap into it, become part of it? What tools and rules and resources do I have that can allow me to play in it? I didn't play the games. I saw that audience and I saw how they worked. And I saw, I saw, issues that were relevant to my basketball, baseball, football, and other teams that I owned, 
And I thought, I better pay attention to this audience because I see a lot of them aren't really going to the basketball and football and baseball games. And I looked at it and said, I have to learn about it. I have to figure out how it works. I got to figure out what pulls it together. So I started down that road and made an investment, brought in partners, uh, really major sports partners, brought in uh, again, partners with some players and used my wallet to underwrite the experience of learning about it. And it brought a whole different view to me on how I look at digital audiences. What, what the difference between a digital audience and an analog audience? What does a digital audience want to do? And how do they interact with the, the medium? And it gave me an opportunity to learn. And the best way to learn is jump in the water and swim. So I put my wallet, and my time, and my effort, and my resources together and uh, built a platform to learn. And some of the statistics are utterly remarkable about how quickly stadiums fill up to, to watch gamers. I um, recently read, and I know you're an investor, an, an investor in Fortnite, that the Fortnite streamer Ninja collaborated with Adidas to launch a, a custom designed pair of trainers, which sold out in an hour. And so these people are becoming celebrities in their own right. And for sure, and not only are they celebrities, but it's another way to look at celebrities. It's another way to talk to, you know, analog celebrities. So exactly, analog celebrities. Yeah, and so, so really what happens is it's, it's another way to look at the experiences and how you bring that experience into your traditional media. And what do you do to touch that audience or bring that component into your audience? Listen, one of the great things is that this is – it's great that this is an evolving and highly competitive environment. We're competing for mind share of audiences and time share of audiences. So whether it's with food or whether it's with gaming or whether it's with betting or whether it's with uh, in, in, in venue uh, uh, events, whatever it is, we're competing to get that mind share and time share and their wallets uh, into our business. And that's, and you can learn about it from all these different areas. I'm not convinced, I'm just not convinced that in-venue experience, in-venue experience will go away. I think the modern campfire has been with us for 50,000 years. I don't think uh, 260 days of COVID is going to prevent that from coming back. Well, I want the audience to hear your optimism. I'm going to ask one last question and one bonus question to Peter. But the, the last question, I'll start with you, Michael. You, you know, you, you've been a leader um, before and you've come into the sports world and you have coaches, you have superb athletic teams. What have you learned about leadership by observing coaches and these superb athletes in the way they function in teams? What, what does that tell you that's different than what you knew before? I think my person to personalize it, the biggest thing is, and Peter just painted the picture of this learning. Um, I've, I've always tried to, you know, from the people around me, both that I'm observing, but also that are on my team, how can I surround myself with people that I can learn from to make myself better? Right an example of which is when I was in Brooklyn, I didn't know the ticketing business at all. I knew the sponsorship business. So I went out and hired the best ticketing person in the business, not because I was afraid that this person was going to overshadow me, but I'm going to learn the ticketing business. Let me learn from the best. So I think, you know, that's sort of my takeaway is in order to continue to advance and excel and Peter is much more accomplished than I am and he's still doing it. So if Peter can do it, I think we all can do it. Peter, what have you learned from the great coaches and teams that you observe? Well, you know, I think it's, it's um, the idea of uh, having a curious person at the center, like Michael is. I listened to him, I was very impressed, Michael. Uh, uh, um, a curious person at the helm of any organization or enterprise. Uh, a person who's curious doesn't exert themselves over the superiority of the question. He looks at things when questions comes up, but what is it telling me? Not what is it asking me? Uh, they, the idea that they create an organizational effort, you know, that they realize that sometimes the organization wants to be pushed and you got to push them. And sometimes it needs to be pulled and you got to pull them and you got to know the difference. And, you know, 
And when you have leaders that can help the team win by you know, even some eccentricity and thinking out of the box, you got to be open to it. And so the idea is everything is constantly changing. You want to be an advocate to be curious, but not critical, to be open to change and be an advocate for change, but thinking it through so that the change is purposeful. And when leaders, whether they're coaches or whether they're men like Michael running a team or me like running a movie company, whatever it is, your, your organizational effort, your organizational effort has to be the idea of always constantly being curious, always constantly asking how to, or what if, how come, and not worrying about you don't have the answers, but be willing to be in the uncertainty of the search. And when you do that, you come up with new ideas and you take new kinds of chances, and that's where real evolution and change happens. And that's what leadership has to do, because they don't have to have the answer. They have to create the environment, the culture that honors that process. And I think that's what the great, great leaders do. And you got a good one in your company, and Arn Tellum, too. So he's a good man. He's a great man. And he's been, he's been great to, uh, to learn from in this short time that I've gotten to know him thus far. So I've got... A, a quick bonus question for each of you, if you can answer it very quickly. And to you, Michael, I'm asking you to give quick advice to the students who are observing today. And I want to prompt you with the story of the alarm clock. <laughs> um, sure. So to give a quick background, uh, my first day, I was a junior in college and I was interning for a gentleman by the name of Brett Yormark, who's one of the leaders in our, our business. And he asked me to meet him at 4.30 uh, to go over things. And, and knowing him, I had to ask, was that AM or PM? Uh, the answer was AM. And um, I guess from that point forward, meeting him at 4.30, I never looked back. But um, it, it's been an, an interesting and, and circuitous road to get to where I am today. But if, if I was to give some advice, particularly to the students, um, you know, early in your career, never made, I've never made a decision thus far in my career that was financially motivated. I always looked at it from, if I want to get to, from point A to point B, how can I get there? Um, and what's the, the best avenue for me to do that? And for me, it was staying in, you know, with the Brooklyn organization for as long as I did versus hopping around. In other cases, that could be different for people, but the opportunity that I was provided there to continue to learn and grow uh, was paramount to everything else. So Peter, this is um, asking you to introspect a little. Recently you um, volunteered, it was a big sacrifice, I'm sure, your 2014-15 um, championship ring of the Golden State Warriors. And I can tell you, it's a big ring covered in diamonds. And you volunteered that for auction on behalf of COVID relief efforts over your Oscar. And I want to know, why did you choose one of the other? Uh, I, it, it, it just didn't matter to me. The, the idea is that uh, the, the process only signifies that I achieved the particular goal that I, was, I set out to do and was honored by a group of people to get that goal, whether it's winning the championship or whether it's an Academy Award or a Golden Globe. Uh, I never really felt that that was the goal, to have that piece of metal or that ring. The process, the journey, was the whole element. I mean, when you stand there and you look at people in an audience who laugh and cry and cheer at the you know, film you made, it makes a difference even in the world, you know, it, with a larger audience, or you feel the sense of fulfillment by seeing a team come together, but all the pieces come together, a sports team come together and start from the very bottom and keep building and, and the, the coaches come in, you fine tune it, and then you get to, compete against other really superb athletes and you get fortunate enough and lucky enough to be part of the ride for it to win. It's, it's a combination experience for a lot of people. You just have to cherish that. And that, all that is is a symbol of the experience. It isn't something that, that, that resonates having it. It's, a, it's a, um, the experience reminder. And it reminds me of that. I don't have to have it in my hand to remind me what a great feeling it was to see those last uh, few ticks end of the clock and we were the champion from a team that was virtually at the bottom of the heap. So the idea is that's not the goal, that's just a symbol from the goal. And the goal is to be able to ha and have an achievement that you participated in. You don't own the achievement, you're a participant in the achievement. 
and to be part of it and to feel you contributed to it and feel the outcome, that's all it is. And you have that in your heart. You don't have to have it on your ring, on your finger. Well, uh, I'm wishing you guys and everyone that we get to the other side of this period, this pandemic, quickly, that you get fans back in the seats and that you continue to give everyone, through all that you do, wonderful experiences. Thank you. Thanks for the conversation. And thank you, everyone, for participating. And let's keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.